definitely the community vibe of Napier Quarter is is amazing and I'm, that's what we were aiming for. But we have the same customers in there every day of the week. Like the local community in Fitzroy love Napier Quarter and they are there constantly. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. In the hospitality sector, real connections can be made. Connections with producers, with guests, and of course, with those you work with. As careers evolve, there are many who find similar beliefs, passions, and land on the same page in regards to the art of hospitality. When those people join forces, they become a force of nature to help forge new paths for the culinary landscape. Eileen Horsnell is the head chef of Melbourne's Napier Quarter. Eileen, how are you going? I'm good. How are you? Good. Thanks for joining us. You um, probably have the most photographed dish of uh, 2020, <laughs> which <laughs> could be a, um, a blessing or a curse. Are we talking about the, the anchovy toast? Yes, <laughs> that's right. It could be a blessing or a, a curse. I know signature dishes um, can be either for, for many in the industry. Um, what's it, what's it been like since you've been at Napier Quarter and the attention that it's garnered? Um, well, I actually helped open Napier Quarter. Um, so four years ago when they first opened there, um, I worked with Daniel Lewis, who's the owner in Brisbane. Um, so I helped him open that. Um, and because I'd moved interstate from Br- Brisbane to Melbourne, I sort of needed to get myself out there for a while. So I helped open for the first six months and then I went to Lume for two years and now I've been back at Napier Quarter again for two years. So um, it's definitely in the last two years become a very small wine bar to getting its first chef hat and and becoming a a non-stop. Like we are so busy there constantly and we open from nine o'clock in the morning until 10 o'clock at night and it's packed the entire time <laughs> so um and we do we do like that anchovy toast runs throughout the day I put it on four years ago so um and I've tried to take I've actually taken it off the menu um but we just special it every day because people would not deal with it not being on the menu so so we have to keep it on and I, I guess I love it in a way because it is perfect just in in its simplicity. It's it's a perfect little snack. So, Well, for those that haven't had the fortune of trying it, could you tell us what the dish is and, uh, and the impact that it's had? Yeah. Um, it's just – it's basically a piece of rye toast. So we get our rye bread from – because we are a very small kitchen, so we get our bread from Baker Blue. Uh, and then it's just some mayonnaise, a boiled egg, perfectly boiled egg, um, green sauce, which is basically the salsa verde, um, and then anchovy fillets on top. And we're using the oligusti anchovy fillets, which are meaty and beautiful. So, and a lemon cheek that comes from my lemons will be in season now. So we just use whatever the best lemons are that are in season. I have a great um, citrus farmer from out in the Yarra Valley who delivers those to us every week. So, yeah. But in everything that we do there, in the anchovy toast to all of the other dishes, it's always focused on the producers that we're getting. Um, You know, we use about four different farms there just for fruit and veg. We started growing our own stuff out in Newstead. So um, we're working on a patch. So that's our next venture, basically. So we have the Napier Quarter, uh, the wine bar, then we have the guest house next door, and now we have a patch out in Newstead. So that'll be, I'll be working on that one day a week to sort of get it up and going, which is really exciting to not, to, to be, you know, something outside of the kitchen and working with the vegetables that we're going to use in the kitchen. Um, So, yeah. You mentioned uh, that you worked with Daniel Lewis in uh, Brisbane and then connected in uh, Melbourne as well. What, what is it about that connection and, and working together that works for you guys? Uh, Daniel and I, I, I've known Daniel since I was maybe 20 Five. I used to go into his cafe. So we started this amazing cafe in um, Brisbane called Pearl. Um, and he just did uh, the whole vibe of it was just a step up from the rest at that time. And so I regularly went there 
um, for breakfast or just for a piece of cake. Um, and it was amazing. And actually all the chefs in Brisbane, that was like their favourite cafe. Everyone went there. So we started talking then and eventually – uh, maybe by the time I was 29, I started working for him and we've just had a great connection ever since. Um, I guess our values align with what we want to do, um, with wanting to progress and be both being like quite ambitious. Um, and we sort of have this perfect link up, like I'm on food, he does like the styling. And then Simon, who's a part of Napier Quarter does all of the wine. So it works. We work the three of us together work really well in in the dynamics and like the strengths that we have and I guess we see our strengths um but Dan and I yeah we have worked together such a long time because basically even when I even when I have left in the past when I did go to Lume for two years we spoke all the time I still helped and did a bit, bit of menu menu consulting for Napier Quarter um we just sort of, I think he loves my style and I like his style. So <laughs> uh, it's hard to separate in a way. You mentioned that you were there at the beginning uh, before you moved to Lume. And we can talk about Lume in a little while. And then you've come back. How different is Napier Quarter to the initial idea? Um, from the initial idea, look, I don't think we always crave to be successful, but I didn't realise it would become as successful, which is um, which is very pleasing. Um, I think that we started off, we just wanted to do quite simple, almost farmhousey style of food. Um, and then I don't know if it's my drive or my ego, it just sort of kept on pushing us, pushing us <laughs> a little bit more. And the menus just became, you know, we started off with just me and one other chef in that kitchen, open seven days a week so um, and open all day. So we sort of slowly built up. Now we've got a team of six chefs um, and very solid, like, head chef, sous chef, junior sous chef in that, that tiny space, which seems ridiculous. But um, <laughs> the size of our kitchen I keep on bringing up, it's basically the size of, um, like, it's two square metres pretty much. Uh, it's it's tiny. You can fit two chefs in there. Um, and there's also the dishwasher is in there. So I guess, like, what we thought we could achieve in that space um, has gone far beyond that um, because, you know, we can't we, – we make all of our own cakes and uh, we make everything that we can from scratch. The only thing we don't make is – basically our bread because we do not have the kind of space to be making bread there. But it's really hard to explain to people unless they see the size, like the the dining room as well seats so about 30 people, but that's quite t- like that's like sardines in a tin and, and that's sort of <laughs> – but people love it. Um, the the Definitely the community vibe of Napier Quarter – his is amazing and I'm, that's what we were aiming for. But we have the same customers in there every day of the week. Like the local community in Fitzroy love Napier Quarter and they are there constantly. And then you'll feel on the weekends it's very much out of t- from people from surrounding suburbs. But, um, you know, I guess in saying that, the community feel like that really got us through those those difficult times through COVID last year because we very have those people that come in there every single day and that did support us. Like they they supported us all the way through and and you know with only having people allowed to come from five kilometers away, like we are so grateful that we've built the restaurant on the basis of community. So. Um, yeah, that that definitely became more highlighted throughout those times as well. So, and we've become even even the regulars that we did talk to every day. Um, it's now there's full blown relationships. Like it's hard for me to walk from the kitchen to the cool room, which is out the back of the restaurant, without being stuck talking to people all the way through. So. <laughs> I think my sous chef just goes, like, oh, Eileen's off talking to, like, five different customers on the way to the fridge now. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we did, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a really um, – I'm really proud of what we've done with this space. Um, and 
the, also with the guest house um, that only just opened in March last year or the end of February. And then obviously it was closed again for most of last year, but we are trying to do a beautiful experience where the guests get to become part of our family for the few days that they come and stay there. Um, um, and, and we're hoping to, well, we're not hoping to, we're going to this year start doing some, um, I don't want to call them cooking schools, presentations in the guest house. Uh, so once, so, so I'm going, I'm jumping all over the place, but basically, um, Dan and I, with the patch that we've got out in Newstead, with me working on that, I want to, um, you know, learn a bit more about farming and gardening and that sort of stuff because it's a very big interest of mine and it all works together with preparing the food as well. Um, but I want to grow it and then use it to teach people how to cook with the stuff that they've grown in these presentations. So that's what we're looking to for the end of the first spring to start doing that so that's really exciting like it's ever in such a small space small restaurant then we've got the guest house in the patch there's so much to do and so much going on um it's 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 never a boring place to be and Daniel and Simon are always very excited and inspirational about like what new projects that we can start to do together basically you mentioned the shared values between uh, yourself, Simon, and Daniel. Um, can you tell us about what they are and, and the offering that you're giving and trying to achieve uh, in regards to hospitality and Napier Quarter? Yeah. So as I said, um, a neighbourhood community-focused uh, bar, we focus really highly on the artisans, so the producers we use all local producers for our charcuteries, um, for our cheeses, and we definitely try and keep that in Victoria, definitely after how last year was. So we're using, so supporting all the local, like, artisan makers around the area. And then with the food, all of the small plates that we offer. So mostly we do small plates there because we don't have the space to be doing meals individually. So it's all very shared, um, the offering. Uh, we, I use um, farmers, so Somerset Heritage. I use another farmer out in Keylor who's – so all organic producers basically. Um, so that's what we focus our small plates and our menu on. So we all share – I guess Daniel, Simon and I all share a passion for supporting small local companies, um, farmers, Etc. Um, you'll definitely see that with Dan, with Simon's wine list. Um, there's a lot of local. He does love, and I guess all of us do love uh, Italian wines and <laughs> Spanish wines. They're still featured on the menu, um, but that definitely comes across with the food as well. My um, influence has heavily been sort of that a little bit Spanish Italian vibe throughout my cooking, and so and. And Daniel's, I guess, style um, very much suits a, a Euro style as well. So I guess for all of us, that blends together really well. Um, yeah. You mentioned you'll have your hands in the soil at Newstead, growing your own produce for the restaurant. Where, where does where does that connection for you, where did it all start? Um, well, <clears throat> basically from my nan when I was a kid, um, she was a farmer. Um, and then basically by the time I was, well, when I was old enough to start helping her, she'd, she'd stopped farming. She'd obviously retired, um, but she just had the biggest vegetable garden in her backyard. Her whole yard was just dedicated to growing vegetables and her whole front yard was dedicated to growing flowers. So she really taught me, the value of, and I guess the values of the seasons going past um, from a child and she used to do a lot of, um, you know, if there was an excess amount of beans, she'd like be pickling them. Like she taught me how to do all of that with, so she taught me to start making pickles when I was about uh, 10 and how to bake cakes and then we used to make stocks together and, and so she was very much, making everything from scratch. Like we were doing the pickles, we were doing stocks, baking cakes, um, and, and it was all the stuff coming from her garden a lot of the time. So 
Um, you know, when we'd make a cake, we'd decorate it with beautiful flowers from my front garden. So I really loved that connection to knowing where your food come, came from, basically, from picking it and then and then eating it fresh out of out of the garden rather than uh, going to a store and having no connection at all with it. Um, she used to kill her own quails um, and chickens as well. So, uh, yeah, there was uh, – <laughs> I think the first time I watched a chicken – get killed I was a little bit uh, upset but I still ate it so (laughs) um, but that connection for me has always been there and it's always been something I guess living in the city has definitely after a while just become like I want a little bit of a country lifestyle as well a little bit of balance between the two and definitely after last year um, I just put things in perspective so I just said to Dan and Simon, look, I want to start working out there. So I've actually part-time moved to the country and I part-time live in the city, which is really great because then I get to be out and work on the land a bit. Um, and I also get that nice balance of being in the city and still running the restaurant. Um, but, yeah, that definitely came from my nan, as much as that might upset my mum to hear that sometime. Well, let's look at the early days in, in your career where you first got a start in hospitality. What, what was it like in the kitchens back then? Because you've worked for some pretty incredible restaurants through your career. I have. Um, I think <laughs> when I very first started, I was only 16, and I don't think I really knew what I was doing at all. Um, so I sort, of, I sort of feel the first few years that I was actually in kitchens, I wasn't really... I don't think I was mature enough to really know that the whole vibe of the kitchen was very different back then. I grew up in a small, it's not really a small town, but on the central coast of New South Wales, so it's very, uh, there's not much foodie stuff going on. So I guess my career didn't take off until I was around 20 when I moved to Queensland and I started cooking with, uh, I think the most inspirational person that I started cooking with was Brenda Forden, who um, owned a restaurant called Mondo Organics. Um, it was back then, it's not, it's closed down completely now, but back then it was the first licensed organic restaurant. Um, and working there, I felt definitely just started getting completely inspired by um, using the, losing, using all of the farmers. So, um, and just uh, Brenda is a really inspirational, strong woman who'd been, you know, I think she's about 60 now, but she'd been cooking since she was about, I don't know, 19, but really, you know, Italian style. Um, she did cooking schools there. She's done tours. She's written two books. Like she was, she was very in, um, like inspirational. And then while I was there, I got an opportunity to work at Urbane, which was a fine dining, and I'd never done that before. And I was like, oh, I don't know, I'm scared, I'm scared. Anyway, (laughs) I I went there for uh, just over a year, and I loved it. Um, And that's when I led on to going to Biota after that. Um, So that was a really amazing experience, Um, helping open a restaurant. So that was the first time I'd ever helped open a restaurant. It's really tough. And then the second time was at Napier Quarter helping open. I don't know why anyone wants to start open a restaurant like from scratch because it's very, (laughs) it's really tough. But at Biota it was, yeah, it was, it was an intense time for all of us. I think we opened the restaurant. It's all a blur now, but I feel like we opened it um, over Easter weekend, like was the first opening weekend. So we really, and we'd really set our standards high. So Biota in that time, um, yeah, it, was, it, was a, it, was a, it was a very uh, sleepless um, few months of, I think we were in there at 7 a.m. every day and we would go home at about 2 a.m. So um, that's what an opening team of, of a fine dining restaurant feels like, I think. And and thankfully, things are a bit different now in the industry. So that's ten years ago. So um, I'm thankful that you know that the industry norms are not uh, seventeen hour days anymore. So and 
And I, I remind my young chefs of that often. <laughs> <laughs> At, at Biota, James Files really tried to create a, a, a sense of place in regards to the restaurant and foraging was very much part of the makeup of the offering. What was it like working with James and, and uh, that exploration of the local area? Um, he was, uh, you know, he was very inspiring to me because he, uh, I'd never, I'd never met someone who worked with that philosophy as much before I met James. And he grew up in um, Bowral, so he had, like, quite a connection to the place as well. He knew all of the hiding spots for all of, like, the wild watercress and wild herbs growing around the place. Um, and we did used to go foraging for all of our oh, – I remember just at Belengalo Forest, which is – a scary place at night time, but we used to go there to pick all of our mushrooms. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> Which is scary. When you actually, when you go to Bulingo Forest, it says um, enter at your own risk. Wow. So, yeah. Um, because that was where Ivan Malat did all those things. Um, so that's a whole nother story. There's a lot of, there's a lot of ghost stories around Barrel as well. So it was interesting in multiple ways, <laughs> but he, um, our, we, we did this, um, we went and met some, he used to get uh, a breeder to, um, basically we would visit the pigs throughout their life until they would come in and go to the abattoir and then end up in our dining room. So, yeah, we did regular visits out to farms and met, basically met the animals. I got really connected to one of the pigs. I couldn't eat it. I remembered which one it was when I was cooking it. Um, but we... We, <laughs> I, I just couldn't, I just, I don't want to taste your meat. Like I, I quite like it. Um, <laughs> so yeah, we, we were very connected to the land um, and the animals out there. And I, I think that I thought I was ready to move to a small town like that. Um, but I was a bit too young to be in a town where the, uh, it's it's a it's barrels a beautiful place to visit, but um, living there as a twenty seven year old um, queer person wasn't really ideal. <laughs> a single person <laughs> in a restaurant, so I like yeah I learned so much from James and his whole philosophy, and I think that I still carry that some of that with me. Um, and definitely Sean was he was the head chef there as well. So um, James was executive chef and. Sean was head chef. I think that those two had worked be- together quite a bit before and they worked really, like, those two were just amazing, like, wizards, basically, in the kitchen. And I guess Sean Quaid's um, uh, wizardy ways and then mixed with uh, mixed with James's ideals of the land and, and how we were going to get our produce and where it was coming from was a really great match. Like, um yeah. You mentioned Sean Quaid's wizardy ways and Lume Dining was certainly could be described in that manner. What was it like going to that kitchen and doing food with such a different connection to produce? Um, well, the reason Sean asked me to come in there and work is because he wanted me to bring that connection more that he, he was, he's very creative in a way um, with <sighs> – I don't know if you've tasted his food before, but yeah, um, where you you don't you some you a lot of the time you don't know what you're eating when you're eating it, and in, in, you're taking on a journey with every dish. Um, he wanted me there to s- source um, local farmers' produce um, to to find more individual small scale places um, because he really wanted that to be a part of Lume as well. So that was one of the reasons that I was there. Also that Sean and I had worked together quite a few years before um, and we did have a really good working relationship and he needed to be, I guess, step out of the kitchen more and let me um, take charge. But his style of cooking to my style of cooking is um, extremely different. So I was basically running the kitchen and making sure that we had the best produce um, in in there because I think that as much as Sean really, really cares about that, but he's, um, he's driven more by 
creating something extremely unique than he does to spend the time searching the producers, basically. Whereas I'm passionate about what producers we're using. And the food, I let it speak for itself a little bit more. So, yeah, with Sean and I, I think after I left Lume, I said, let's not talk for a year, but we're talking again now. (laughs) (laughs) Just because we were really tired. Um, (laughs) No, and he's moved over to L.A. now. And he's making vegan cheese, which is incredible. Like, he gave me lots of samples before he left. He's just, like, I don't know where he comes up with the things that he's doing sometimes. Like, he's making he's making um, feta out of hemp seed. Um, yeah. And I was I was just like, what, how, how are you actually doing that? Like, um, yeah, I've, I've had other chefs say to me, I've tried to make it, just guessing what he's doing, and they can't figure it out. <laughs> so, so he'll have to, uh, you know, I'm sure he'd let me know, but I, yeah, I, I don't think I need to be making hemp cheese over here. Well, your uh, style of cooking, as you mentioned, is um, has an amazing connection to produce and letting it shine on the plate. Tell, tell us about um, the connection that you have with farmers and and what it's been like trying to create those connections over the years. Um, it was very interesting when I first moved here because I've been in Melbourne now almost five years. <clears throat> and when I first, I had fantastic supplies that I'd spent like 10 years finding or, or you know, over the years getting to, in Brisbane. And I I had, you know, three great farmers that I used and all of my suppliers, like my meat supply, I had great connections up there. And when I moved here, I felt like I had to start again. (laughs) So I remember talking to this uh, farmer um, and he owns Days Walk Farm. He's at, no, he he, he used to own Somerset, sorry. He's since sold it um, to a girl, Chloe. But anyway, when I called him, it's almost like I had to do an interview to explain who I was and why I cared about using his produce and what I was going to do with his produce um, because he wanted to make sure that people were treating the food that he was spending his life growing was treated with respect. So I, I did that and I had to do it with quite a few people like because a lot of these farmers... They'll only supply to certain restaurants that they respect each other. You know, you can't you, – these farmers walk in and if a chef's rude to them, they just walk out again. <laughs> they're not, they're not, they're not going to put up with it, you know. So, um, yeah, it's, it was almost like an interview process um, with Somerset and then with Days Walk. They only allow a certain number of restaurants to use them. And then Mick, who I get all my citrus from, his dad has owned an orchard for 60 years and now he does experimental farming on there. So he does like, you know, alpine strawberries and like really beautiful berries and he, he grows all weird and wonderful different herbs. So he does all of that and he just asks chefs, what do you want? And he only, I think he only supplies to 10 of us. And they ask us, what do you want me to plant? Like, and he'll plant something especially for you and then bring it in for you. Um, but he's saying that his um, dad has that orchard. They have the best Maya lemons that I've ever tasted. And I'm so excited that Maya lemon season's back again because, yeah, <laughs> they are amazing. I preserve them every year because we would just want to continue to have them throughout the year. Um, yeah, so I think that I slowly, you know, and then with Jody with Great Ocean Ducks, you know, she only – and, and this is the thing, and, and a lot of, I guess, a lot of chefs don't have the time or patience for it because I have to order on a f- Friday for delivery the next Thursday, and that's with a lot of places. Um, I get my cheese from Holy Goat, and I have to let her know on Saturday, and then it gets delivered on Wednesday. Like some people can't, don't want to think that far ahead, <laughs> and they want to see what stuff they've got. So, yeah, I, I guess with all of the small guys, you've got to be – um, build a really great relationship with them, which feels nice because it feels like I feel like I get to hear about the goats that are producing the milk that we can get our cheese from. Like I get a call like, oh, this isn't matured yet. 
um, and you know they're so they're so proud of what they do. They would never just they they will wait and communicate. You're talking directly to the person who's making the cheese. Like it just feels so much nicer than going. Okay, I'm just going to call up the local cheese company and order a cheese, and then complain if something if if something's not available. Like I just say to the staff, that's not available today because the farmer. It's you know it's not mature enough to cheese or this or the salami hasn't aged enough or like this like so we don't compromise on on quality forever and we're always use, it's always about using the small guys and supporting them and not getting things through the I guess almost I do I do all the middle work <laughs> like, you know I could be I could basically be a supplier to all the restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> But I like to. I love to know. I love to talk directly to the person who's making it or growing it. Um, I don't want to just call up a supplier and have them secondarily explain everything to me. So, yeah, it it it's that's almost a full time job doing all of that stuff, and I love it. So, <laughs> your plans for this year to um, grow your own produce? Is there anything that you're planning to grow or excited about growing? I'm pretty much excited to grow everything because I'm really I'm, I'm excited to grow good carrots because I can't grow carrots I've tried at home so many times and I know that sounds really boring but and but I I just I'm just excited to grow everything like excited for beans I love anything on a vine um but I want to grow like we've got a, a sort of small orchard around the place and um, if if you've ever seen my menus, every dish that I, every savory dish I have in the menu has fruit in it. I'm a bit um, meat and fruit obsessed, so I'm excited to see all of the, all of the um, quince, the quinces. There's apples growing, there's pears growing out there. Like I'm excited for the ber- for berry season. I do, I do love fruit a lot, and so I will be excited to see all of that stuff that we've like started planting. And some of these um, trees were already established on the property when it um, when Dan got it. So, um, I yeah, I'm excited because we basically just did one plant run over summer, and we just planted a whole heap of tomatoes just to sort of get the soil um, activated and to see how everything was growing. And we we got so many tomatoes. We realised that next tomato season we would almost have enough tomatoes to supply the restaurant. Completely. So at the moment, it's all practice and playing around and seeing what works um, in the area. But we grew so many pumpkins as well. Like we just want to start basic and maybe just do one large crop of things and see if it can supply the restaurant. But then see see if we need to grow it even further. So we're looking at getting a greenhouse now. And I just, I don't know. I don't even know which vegetable I'm most excited to grow. I'm just excited to be a part of the whole picture, you know, and the whole process of it coming from a seed and us planting it and then taking it into the restaurant and preparing it and then serving it to a customer, like the whole lifespan of the vegetable. I guess that's what I'm excited about. Um, just stepping or stepping the whole way along. So, Yeah. Well, it sounds amazing and very much looking forward to see how that manifests on the menu moving forward as you create your own produce. Um, congratulations on the amazing success that you guys have had in the last couple of years. And um, we're honoured to have you on Deep in the Weeds today. Please keep in touch and we'll talk again soon. Okay, great. Thank you. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's HOSPA community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.